whatever. They're just deer, right? So um, I was biking to um, my, um, my place where I was sleeping um, in one of the houses. And there were some deer hanging out in the field next to my, my house where I was staying. So I was ri riding my bike, I was going along, it was really cool. And the deer, I was like, oh wow, those deer look really beautiful and I'm coasting by. And I slammed the brakes and I flew off my bike, right? <sighs> and I looked up and seriously, the deer were like, oh my God, did you see what he did? <laughs> like they totally were just like, <laughs> they sort of gave me this look like, oh my God, that's so embarrassing, like don't look. <laughs> and I and then I was like, shit, I can't believe I did that in front of them. So it caused me a little bit of an existential crisis because I realized that I was trying to impress animals. <laughs> they could care less about me. I when I was there, I actually saw a rabid coyote. Really? No. Yeah, yeah I could tell. I mean, it was really disoriented. It was foaming at the mouth. And I That's and it scary. Was not afraid of me, and it was just sort of like wandering in this little circle. Where was you? Which cab? Yeah. Which which house were you in? Star was my studio. Oh, that's on that road, right? That little road. Yeah. That's. Great. You know what? I was in Chapman at the end of the road. Oh yeah, yeah, I but remember the, that. The furthest from the like the main house. Everybody was like, you know, you're you're the furthest one from the main house. I'm like, great. Like, like they were saying like it was a cool thing and I kind of felt like um, somebody's going to come murder me out here and <laughs> like nobody will know yeah but yeah it was I mean being there at night like in, I never stayed like around after the sunset because it was just so dark there yeah it's nice it is it's nice it, it's nice but if you're a city boy like me it is kind of scary yeah, I could see that. But but it was my I got a lot of work done. I think I did too, I don't remember. It's a long time ago. <laughs> and then they give you lunch and dinner and bring you a picnic basket. Yeah, a picnic basket. So yeah, so so MFA students, like that's what you want to strive for is to apply to those residencies where they, they treat you like royalty and they feed you and they give you space. <laughs> no internet connection. So what time is it? Do we we'll give people a couple more minutes, maybe. Oh. Allegra's here. Is Allegra here? There there she is. There she is. You ready to do your introduction? Caldwell's doing it, so we oh. have to oh. get back. He's a I thought you guys were gonna do like some humorous thing. Oh my god. Uh we were, um, but then but then workshop happened, right? <laughs> and they're like, shit, screw him. <laughs> well, I guess we could get going. What do you think, Luke? Are there more people trickling in? We've had a couple uh, trickling in here, but it is slowing down. Um, and we are all connected and everything. So, uh, I'd say yeah. once, once Ben's back, we're good to go. Okay. And the YouTube thing is hooked up. Yeah. Oh, it's, cool. it's being recorded, huh? Yeah. And we'll post it on our site, okay. you know, the YouTube sure link. I, look, I have to make sure I look pretty, man. This light, I swear, my, I got this light and it looks like I'm being interrogated by the police. Like, <laughs> yeah, it does a little actually. Of, right? <laughs> I thought, like, initially I thought, oh, this is perfect for Zooming. And then I started messing with them. Like, it looks like I'm in some police lineup or being interrogated. Where are by. you the evening of December 17th, yeah. Alex? <laughs> you know something, don't you? <laughs> it's like law and order. <laughs> So Luke is the one, Luke will be the one who's like our web person and he's got the YouTube thing running and he'll be able to relay, at the moment we're, when you're done reading, he'll be able to relay questions from the okay. YouTube side or from the chat or whatever. So when, when we're done, people want to um, 
ask questions. You can type them into the comments or you can just raise your hand and talk, whatever you feel like doing. Anything? Did I miss anything? Cool. All right. And so now we have Ben Caldwell up to do an introduction for Alex. Hey, okay. <laughs> so Alex Espinosa was born in Tijuana, Mexico and raised in suburban Los Angeles. He graduated from the University of California, Riverside and earned his MFA from UC Irvine's program in writing. He's the author of Stillwater Saints, The Five Acts of Diego Leon, and Cruising, an Intimate History of a Radical Pastime. He is the recipient of a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts and is currently the Tomas Rivera Endowed Chair of Creative Writing at UC Riverside. All right, thank you. How's everybody doing? Good? It's, it's, it's weird doing a reading on Zoom. I've, I've done them before, but, but um, I, still, I still am not used to the, um, the sort of the, uh, uh, the wonders of technology. Um, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad to, to be able to uh, share this space with, with all of you um, and to see the faces of my good friends, Greg and, and Caridwin, who I've known for, for many years um through the the community of writers um and um you know it's it's one of the things i think that makes uh the writing life so uh, rich and wonderful are the friendships that you make and the different communities that that you build out of it and um <coughs> i'm happy to have greg and, and caribbean be part of that community uh, i just I, I i know that someday soon we'll all be in the mountains near Lake Tahoe again, uh, singing songs by the fire um, and gossiping uh, <laughs> the way we used to. We had some, we've had some really good times um, and, and, I, and I, I miss them, but I know that we'll be back to it. Um, I had a great time meeting everyone today at the workshop. It was really fun. Thank you, Allegra and Ben, for being generous with your, with your work and for allowing me to to read it and to comment on it and, and to talk about it. Um, it was such a joy and, um, you know, getting lost in those stories. Um, it's it's kind of what's keeping me right now and what's sustaining me. Um, I, I'm primarily, you know, a fiction writer and um, never thought really about writing nonfiction. And, you know, I'm gonna sort of talk about my, my latest book, Cruising, um, and, and talk a little bit about it. Um, about its genesis and what sort of led me to to write it, and then I'll read some sections, and then uh, hopefully you know we'll have some questions. Um, I, you know, I I started out writing short stories and never saw myself writing any kind of longer sort of piece of nonfiction beyond like, you know, the the the, the random essay here and there. Um, but I was um, living back here in LA, I had moved back um, because I was tired of living in, in Fresno. I was living in Fresno, California for two decades. No, one decade, sorry. It felt like two decades. Uh, Fresno is one of those places where it's really hard to be gay and it's really hard to have a partner. <laughs> um, it's just one of those places that is, it's a tough place. And, um, you know, I was struggling for a long time with my job and, and with, you know, um, uh, with a lot of other things that were happening. And I wanted to move back to LA. I wanted to be back home and uh, I had an opportunity. Um, I met my uh, publisher, uh, Unnamed. It's a small indie press that is here based in LA. And they had published a book that I really liked. And, um, it was a book by a writer um, from Texas. It's called Arcade. And it's about a young man protagonist who is unnamed. And he um, has a really mess messy breakup with the guy and ends up finding uh, solace in um, an adult bookstore near, his, near where he works, right? He has random encounters with men and, um, you know, explores his sexuality through, through those encounters. 
And I really liked the book a lot and it reminded me of John, the writer John Reshi's work. And every time I saw Olivia and Chris, who are my editors are unnamed, I'd say, you know how many people I told about that book? How many people I told to read that book? It's such a great book. There was another book by a, a gay writer that was out that was getting a lot of attention. That kind of felt like, you know, it wasn't as good as, as the attention it was getting. And, and here was this book that was like, I thought was better and nobody was reading it. So I was really frustrated. So um, my, my publishers reached out to me and they said, hey, um, can we take you out to lunch? And I said, yeah, sure. Um, and so they took me out to lunch and they said, you know, have you ever thought about writing a book about, because I, I have talked about my experiences growing up gay and closeted and, you know, the culture of cruising and how I sort of fell into it and what it meant for me, you know. Um, and they sort of said, well, have you ever thought about writing a book about that? And I said, no. Um, and they said, well, we think you should. And I was like, great, I'll get right on that, like right after I'm done writing this other book. And they said, well, we think you should and we wanna publish it. And I was like, bees are on the what now? Like, what, what was that? I don't understand. And they said, yeah, we, we think that you should write a book about sort of the history of cruising and, you know, and just, just so that everybody's clear, cruising, I don't mean like driving around in cars, right? The culture of gay cruising means anonymous sexual hookups with men in public places, right? So, um, so I'm like, you want me to write that? And they said, yeah. They said, we, you know, we think it would be great and, and we want to publish it. So what do you think? And I was like, well, a couple of caveats. I said, I need, I need to make sure that um, I have to include my own experiences. And they're like, great, we want you to. And I said, and you know, um, I also want to include the experiences of men of color because I think that's really important. And they're like, great. Um, so they kind of were like, we're going to write up a contract and reach out to your agent. I'm like, all right, fine, just do it. And then brrr, before I knew it, they were like, all right, we're good. So it was a really weird experience. Like it was the reverse of typically what happens, right? Like, so I tell everyone that story and they're like, really, that, that, that happened? And I said, yeah, it was just sort of, I, I wasn't intending to write this book, but then the more I thought about it, um, because they were like, you know, it, it, take it or leave it. Like it's, it's up to you. And I talked about it with my partner and sort of was like, well, you know, I can, I can put the novel I'm working on on hold right now. I can write this really quickly. Um, so I kind of, that, that's kind of what I did. And, and I wrote this book um, in the middle of a huge transition in my life when my partner was still living in Fresno and I was down here in LA trying to find a place to live for us. Um, I found a house, moved into it while he was still up there. I was chairing another department that was falling apart and I was writing this book. <laughs> and um, I was writing a lot of very personal stuff about my own experiences, um, you know, in, in um, having these encounters, these very intimate encounters with men in public places. And I really didn't have much of an opportunity to really think about what I was putting down on paper or how people were gonna react to it. So that was a very good thing because when it was all said and done and I got the proofs back and I was reading some of the sections, I'm like, holy shit. Oh my God, people are gonna think I'm just like, like crazy like sex addict, right? Like, cause I'm just bearing it all. Um, and and actually it's, it, it, you know, now that I look back on it, I think it was good that it happened that way because I never would have had, I think, the courage to write so candidly about something that um, I was always taught growing up that needed to be something very personal and you don't share it with anyone. Um, and also it ended up being very empowering, not just for me, but for a lot of the readers that I've encountered, right? So you know, this book is, isn't only about the history of, of this cultural practice that exists specifically in the gay community. Um, it's also um, a sort of a meditation on um, our innate human desire to connect with others, right? Our, our need to be, you know, touched by someone, right? And 
I think that's important now more than ever because we are not able to touch each other like physically, right? We're sort of separate from each other. Um, so this book became sort of the meditation on on not just sort of the, you know, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, like men, you know, in bathrooms getting it on, right? It's it's more about sort of it's about that, but it's also the celebration of this cultural practice that I think is one that's rooted in um, radicalism, in um, you know, in a, a radical gay sort of um, philosophy that embraces um, you know body positivity and sex positivity and and my own experience with it right and sort of what it was able to do to me and for me um so i'm gonna read you a couple of, of sections and um sh some short sections and and i hope you know there's there's time for for questions um so i you know um i start with a um, very sort of personal um, story about my own sort of how I was introduced um, to the practice of cruising. Uh, I was 15 and sitting at a bus stop on my way to the mall to pick up my paycheck. I worked at a retail store that sold novelty gifts, greeting cards, stuffed animals, bags of potpourri, and large ceramic masks of gestures and crying clowns that people bought to hang on their walls for some reason. That particular summer was especially hot, even for the San Gabriel Valley. I was in shorts and high tops. And despite the heat, I also wore a thick gray sweatshirt and a flimsy baseball cap. I always wore long sleeves and hats back then. These were part of my armor, how I deflected attention from the imperfections that I was born with, a birth defect that had stunted the development of my right arm, the growing ball patches across my scalp from alopecia areata, that left 10 spots shaped like small continents on my head. There was a portable cassette player clipped to the elastic band of my shorts and I was busy rewinding the tape to the beginning of the boy with the thorn in his side by the Smiths. This was the eighties. Um, to see the white Hyundai Excel hatchback pulling up to the curb a few feet away from where I sat. I noticed it the second time though, because the driver got out, he walked around the side and pretended to inspect the back tire. He wore bright teal shorts, Reeboks, and a tight black muscle shirt. His hair was dark brown and long, glistening with mousse and hairspray that I could smell from my place on the bench. On the third drive-by, he stopped again. He reached across the passenger seat and rolled down the window. Do you want a lift? He asked. I don't mean this to sound overly simplistic, but I came of age during a weird time in American history. I guess everyone thinks that, Though I've often said that the 1980s were particularly challenging for a closeted Mexican kid with a disability. The decade saw the rise of the new right, of Reaganomics and tax cuts for the wealthy, and of a culture that rewarded success and greed, which led to a decade of excess, extravagance, yuppies, individualism, increased isolation, xenophobia, and a rise in cocaine use. It was an era of too much of straight edges and crisp lines, of big shoulder pads and nagel prints with geometric shapes. The zeitgeist failed to consider the way in which want is tied to the balance of perfection, the value that we place on symmetry and excess in relation to desire. My flaws and my imperfections stood out, even in my working class environment where people struggled to make ends meet, where fathers worked in cavernous factories around deadly solvents and dangerous machines that could crush legs and sever arms. Even greater threats like famine, disease, and nuclear annihilation from the Soviet Union loomed on the horizon. And in the midst of this schizophrenic time, when we crave stability as the world around us seemed to be inching toward apocalyptic destruction, I had my first sexual encounter and was introduced to a secret world. There was this thing that happened between the stranger and me that afternoon, something that shattered this illusion I'd been carrying that maybe I wasn't gay. Maybe I would indeed find a nice woman, marry her and raise a family. That's what my mother wanted. That moment with the stranger broke a seal inside of me. Um, it released a flood of emotions and hormones and urges that up until that moment had remained just beneath the surface. I thought about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, 
about the Incredible Hulk, about comic book superheroes with secret identities and closeted gay celebrities like Ramon Novaro and Rock Hudson. I had crossed the threshold and before me now was a world of secret exchanges, of fleeting acts of intimacy occurring in public places. It was a world where I was noticed, where I could perform, where I was needed. Even though my identity as a gay person was nascent in those spaces and those small cracks lying just below the everyday, my sexual identity took root. So, um, you know, it was really difficult for me to, um, to write that, that um, to relive that memory, um, much less sort of, you know, tell it in such a very sort of public um, form. Um, but the good thing about working with my publisher was that they, um, they really want, they really encouraged me to be frank and to be honest. And, um, you know, they, um, they gave me kind of the, 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 really the sort of the, the license to be as forthcoming as I wanted. Um, it was challenging writing this book, not, not, not only for that, but because I was writing about a, um, a phenomenon um, that in a lot of ways is still very misunderstood, right? Um, not talked about, um, though a lot of people do it. And um, there, there's no one central like book that I could reference, right? There isn't like, oh, aha, that book on, you know, so-and-so's book on, on gay sex and cruising in the 1980s or whatever. So I was looking at not just like I was I was getting information not just from you know um, sociology textbooks but I was looking at art books at architecture um, you know uh, um, psychology um, pop culture right um, I was looking at everything from you know um, uh, George Michael's arrest which I'm going to read about. Uh, to um, the 1980 movie Cruising, starring Al Pacino, where he he goes undercover as a um, a gay man, and he like haunts these he because there's a guy who is going from bar to bar like killing men. Um, so Al Pacino, you know, masquerades as a gay guy and like frequents these bars trying to catch this guy. And the film is full of a lot of like really awkward scenes of like Al Pacino in leather gear dancing uh, to disco music. And it's just really bad. And the movie was really upsetting. A lot of a lot of gay activists were upset because of the depiction of gay men as as being brutal murderers and um, you know, living these hedonistic lifestyles, right? So I look at, you know, Greek and Roman um sexuality. I look at Molly houses during the Victorian era in England. Um, the address book, which was this tiny little uh, pamphlet that could fit in your back pocket. It was kind of like the um, grinder before grinder, where um, Bob Damron, who was this um, publisher and, and um, uh, would go around and would um, travel from state to state, finding all the gay sort of owned businesses. It's kind of like the green book, but for, for gay men. So there was listings of bars and restaurants and also cruising spots where you could go, like if say you're in Arizona and you're in Phoenix, it's like, hey, there's this trail here where guys do stuff. And then each listing had codes for like what you can find there. Um, so the book really sort of looks at all of that and and um, I also it also looks at some of the experiences of um, uh, gay men living in um, countries like Russia and Uganda that have very stringent laws against homosexuality, and and how apps like Grinder and Scruff are really changing the culture and not in good ways, right? Where it's putting men's lives in danger, especially in those countries where um, homosexuality is considered a crime, right? And a lot of men have been um, catfished, right? They've been sort of lured out um, by, by fake profiles and they go and they meet with someone and they find out that the person's a cop 
and they end up in jail or dead or never heard from again, right? So um, it was a very exhaustive sort of book. Um, I had lots of resources to look at. So there, was, there wasn't one central sort of book that I could go to. So I was kind of writing it as I went along, <laughs> hoping that it worked. Um, and, you know, um, I, I recount incidences, you know, uh, like I said, like the George Michael incident, um, which I want to read to you now, um, because I think this is a really um, interesting example of how uh, someone can take a taboo um, subject or incident and turn it into something empowering, right? Which is what George Michael really did with his arrest. The incident occurred on a warm spring afternoon in April. The park located at 9650 Sunset Boulevard is just across the street from the famed Fl Flamingo Pink Beverly Hills Hotel. The hotel is a hotbed for both celebrities and the throngs of tourists who arrive by the busload seeking them out. In its glory days, the hotel boasted a roster of celebrity guests that included Elizabeth Taylor, Charles Cha Charlie Chaplin, Rock Hudson, and Joan Crawford, to name a few. If celebrity had its own planet, it would look like the Beverly Hills Hotel, wrote the Los Angeles Times in 2017. There's enough show business lore here, trysts, honeymoons, and naked sunbathing to be a movie in itself, a caddyshack for the rich and resplendent. Still, the old hotel retains a dignity and opulence. So it's a bit ironic then that the public bathroom where George Michael was caught cruising would be located just across the street from this hotel a place where celebrities went to both be seen and to hide away, a place where careers were launched, where others ended, where scandals erupted, and where secret affairs were discovered. The 80s sex symbol was famous for being a male heartthrob who made girls swoon with his thick mane of hair, his bronze skin, and that angelic voice. When he was busted for cruising in Will Rogers Park, that facade came tumbling down, perplexing more than a few people, among them, Lieutenant Crimes, quote, it's not something you'd expect up there, he told the Times. It's pretty much a park where you'd relax, read a book and get some wedding photos taken. This moment forced the singer out of the closet and Michael had to fess up about his secret life as a homosexual, masquerading as a straight pop star whose biggest hits like Careless Whisper with Wham and Faith as a solo artist, the entire world had loved and danced to Yet what might have ruined anybody else's career led to a resurgence in Michael's, which at the time was not exactly on the upswing. His position of defiance and his refusal to apologize for his actions had many gay rights activists interpreting his response as a rebel yell. Michael was not conceding to heteronormative definitions of sex and intimacy. As gay men, we revel in the anonymous hookup. This is part of our culture, he seemed to be saying, it's who we are, it's what we do. If you don't like it, turn the other way. In a television interview on, on NBC in 2004, Matt Lauer asked Michael why he'd behaved in such a risky manner. You can afford privacy, Lauer said at one point. And Michael replied, people actually don't understand the principle of cruising for gay men, but it's nothing to do with necessity. And that's something that I think straight people don't understand. This exchange illustrates one of the most important aspects of cruising. For gay men, it's something that can happen out in the open, an equal exchange between strangers that doesn't need to cause shame and doesn't need to be codified in any other way. By contrast, the indiscretions that Lauer would be accused of and would lead to his ouster from the network over a dozen years later were about power and control. Such unequal exchanges could only occur under highly leveraged and private circumstances. Michael chose to use his outing as an opportunity to shake out his own sexuality and bring it to light. Getting caught might have come with many unintended consequences, but the singer was able to spin a potential PR nightmare into not just a coming out celebration, but artistic success as well. He released the song Outside, a dance hit that fuses disco and funk and extols the virtues of outdoor sex, not to mention his own healthy sexual appetite. In one particular verse, the singer acknowledges his obsession with sex and his rampant libido and his promiscuousness and admits to never having confessed 
any of this before. The music video is shot like surveillance footage as police helicopters uh, hover over the city of Los Angeles and capture various couples engaging in different sexual activities out in the open. Clearly, the video is making pointed commentary on the nature of sex, privacy, and public space. In one scene, a nondescript bathroom turns into a nightclub as disco balls descend from the vents in the ceiling and urinals transform into glass sculptures. Another scene shows two men hopping into the bed of a utility truck parked alongside a busy street. From the helicopter's vantage point high above, we watch as the two men proceed to make out and have sex just a few feet away from clueless pedestrians and passing cars. The penultimate shot shows two LAPD officers approaching a car that they then proceed to search, pulling out various items like leather straps and cameras. The cops surreptitiously glance around before embracing each other and kissing. The final scene zooms in on the large neon red signs above the Ace Hotel in downtown LA that reads, Jesus saves. And before the video ends, the words, all of us, appear in thin, nondescript letters. In 2009, with the Daily Mail, Michael was unequivocal about the benefits of cruising. And perhaps those who took offense at his actions and called the whole thing shameful and vile behavior for such a public figure had a problem not so much with the act itself, but with the singer's defiance, his almost cavalier attitude, his reluctance to stop and behave in a more socially acceptable manner. Or perhaps they were just envious. More people do it than we think, he seemed to be telling us. Get over it. This is my lifestyle, my culture. Who are you to tell us how to behave? Um, so I'll stop with that section. So the, you know, the, the um, if you haven't watched the George Michael video um, outside, I, I strongly encourage you to watch it. It's, it's kind of a little cheeky because he does sort of play with the idea of, of um, public sex, right? Of, of, of flaunting your sexuality, um, all body shapes and forms, right? Um, it's not just like ripped people. Um, it's, it's almost comic, right? Um, and he's making a very pointed comment on our often very sort of prudish, um, uptight attitudes about, about sex and sexuality, something that everybody does, but nobody wants to admit to doing, right? Uh, it's funny because um, this, my book was, was sold to a small LGBTQ um, publisher in Spain. And um, the Spanish people really loved it. Like they, they sort of kind of revel in it. They sort of, you know, I, I think, the the perception of 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 what like public sex means in different countries is fascinating because they've interviewed me and they've been oh yeah you know there's these bathrooms like I know this bathroom and I you know I met up with someone there in this park like they're just full of like and and the book has gotten a lot of attention from Spain in a way that I never anticipated so it's kind of weird um but they have absolutely no you know they have no hangups about it which is which is really fascinating to me because I think even in, in, in my experiences talking about this to very sort of friendly audiences, there's still that sort of sense of re like the reservation, like nobody really wants to sort of like acknowledge it or talk about it or articulate it. Um, so, you know, like I said, it's sort of, you know, after having written the book and after having sort of looked at all of these different pieces that I put together, I realized that so much of, so much of my own meditation on it was um, my uh, need um, to find connection with others, right? Um, the way this experience, taboo as it was, and you know, um, uh, misunderstood as it was, um, allowed someone like me um, an opportunity to gain. Um, confidence, right, in the world. Um, the understanding I was born with was that because I was a disabled person, um, there was no room for me to be sexual or sexualized. Like my body couldn't do that, right? Like, and I think through this practice, what I learned was that it actually, that's not true, right? 
So, um, and, and it, it was a practice that, you know, I and my community have been participating in for centuries, right? That it's something that no matter how many times we, we've tried to regulate it or control it or stamp it out, it still thrives, right? It finds ways because such is the power to connect, right? Such is the power and the desire to find um, connection with someone, a stranger, even if it's for a fleeting moment. And that's what this sort of meditation is on, is on this idea of movement. And then I'll sort of end after this. My experiences have been forged by migration and by the constant and steady flow of bodies and ideas perpetually in transit. My father left my mother and siblings alone in their isolated rancho in the highlands of Michoacan, Mexico. And he traveled north to the US, sneaking across the border, moving from Texas to Nebraska to Illinois before following the stream of relatives to California, where they all eventually settled. My mother couldn't stay put either. Never one to wait, she gathered her children up and early one morning boarded a train and headed north to Tijuana to stay with relatives. There she sent word to my father, and when they reunited, he insisted she tell him why she ignored his request that she stay put. And she replied, you must think I'm stupid. I wasn't going to just wait for you. She used to laugh whenever she told me the story, shaking her head in disbelief. She wasn't thinking, she said. She only knew that if she stayed there in that small pueblo, in that cold brick house with no running water and electricity, she would surely die and so would her children. Everyone was going, she said. The whole place was emptying out. There was nothing left. I wasn't going to just sit by and watch. So I gathered your brothers and sisters and we picked ourselves up and we left too. I've traced the route they took decades ago by train, north into Guanajuato, its hillsides gouged out by miners who discovered plata, silver, hundreds of years before. Northwest through Jalisco, past the fields of agave farms and distilleries that produce tequila. Still farther northwest into Durango, Charro country, through Sinaloa, past Hermosillo, and into the border state of Baja California Norte to Tijuana, where I would eventually be born. Conceived in California, she insisted I be born back there in the Tierra Sagrada of home, that place of ever-changing makeshift colonias, some falling off the map overnight, others springing up so quickly they didn't even have names for them. Perhaps she sensed the spirit stirring in me, jabbing at her rib cage, imploring her to get up and go. I see patterns of movement in everything in the monarch butterflies of my homeland, in the caravans of people streaming out of countries where civil unrest and guerrilla warfare fueled by dictators and despots makes life insufferable. Across the Bering Strait, down from the icy north into the forests of Southern Mexico and central Brazil and into the jungles and tropical forests of Brazil. Movement is in our blood. It's part of our collective human condition we're born out of movement, out of a desire to forge connections with others in order to feel less alone. Or perhaps it's to know and see ourselves, to recognize our struggles in someone else. It's an endless cycle of transit and migration from one fixed point to another and then another. And each time we move and flow, we change a little and we come closer to becoming that person we always imagined ourselves to be. Becoming is never easy. Being tempered and stretched is painful. The body can only take so much. And the trauma inflicted infects the mind, it boils the brain, and it turns our agonies against us. And yet, this, this is how sorrow can become our song. And I will stop there. So, I sort of end the book on this this meditation on this idea of um, you know um, this this practice as sort of a a larger meditation on the desire to to forge connections, right? Um, be that you know in a nondescript bathroom at Macy's or a department store or a rest stop, 
um, or you know the sort of larger meaning of what it means to migrate and move, right? Um, the experiences of writing this book um, showed me that at, at its heart, I think um, this is a practice of um, individuals seeking um, intimate connections with one another, right? Despite you know very repressive laws, despite you know um, uh, homophobia, despite being in the closet, right? That that there's this larger desire uh, to connect, and that that desire is so powerful that it it you know it extends beyond you know um, time and and certainly beyond space too. So there you go. So I hope people have questions. I like questions. Questions are fun. I think I read enough. Did I read enough? Did I read long enough? I did. Right? Is that okay? Okay, good. I don't like to read too long because I don't like to bore people. Breaks even the okay symbol. So it, it, does I know if anybody has questions or shoot. <laughs> Luke says, feel free to type your questions here or to ask out loud. I can ask like a big general question to kind of kick things off while people are being shy and thinking. And so, I mean, like talk about the difference in your um, process, writing fiction versus nonfiction. Like, how does it feel? Um, I mean, whenever I do it, I feel like I'm using a different part of my brain. Like it's just not even the same thing, but I've never written a nonfiction book. So I'm, I'm curious to hear how that, how they compare, like with, process, um, just like how you think about it, work habits, yeah. all of that. Yeah, I mean, it is it is like using a different part of your brain, you're right. Um, like I said, I think one of the challenging things with this book was that I didn't have, you know, like when you're, when you're researching for a novel, you know, you can sort of look at like one specific thing, right? Like, you know, like right now I'm sort of, I'm writing about this, you know this this subculture in, in in Latino culture, the luchadores, the masked wrestlers, right? So it's 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 really sort of that's one thing to research, right? So you can like really get into it. And but with a book like this, it was researching a lot of different aspects of the same thing from different lenses. So um, I felt like in a lot of ways, I was um, it was like like piecing together just a bunch of different things, right? Like like going to a a an all you can eat buffet, right? Like grabbing as much as you can and seeing, okay, what do I got? Um, and that does I think require a certain a difference in um, dexterity when it comes to your writing and a different approach. Um, I I had to be comfortable with um, sounding a little academic, right? A at times, you know, like. Like when I when I use quotes and you know footnotes and 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 all of that, so I had to I had to make sure that I I understood when I could um, switch my the sort of the tenor of my voice, right? Um, depending on what I was explaining or, or 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 trying to say, and that's very different in a lot of ways than fiction when you have like one kind of voice or narrative sort of um, uh, pushing through everything. Also, it's just you know. With the in the with fiction, you can sort of hide behind your characters, right? You can sort of like, well, that didn't happen to me; it happened to my character, right? So there's a little sort of freedom and and flexibility that I think writing fiction allows that that nonfiction just doesn't. You know, you just sort of have to like, you have to bear it all. You know, like I had to be very candid, and I had to be candid and also understand that the um like what what that would mean right in the long run like 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 my being very honest about these experiences that i had like how am i going to be able to live with that right when i when it goes out in the world and i have to talk about it in a way that i just you don't have to with fiction you say well it's my character right like but with this it's like okay you like you did this you experienced this what was it like and so um the the stakes are different you know um, so yeah, so I would say, but, and I would also say that, that writing this, I think, 
made me realize that I actually wasn't um, taking a lot of emotional chances with my fiction in ways that I thought I was, right? Like I sort of was like, oh yeah, you know, I'm being honest and brave in my fiction. But then I wrote this, I'm like, I wasn't doing shit. I was just being like a total, like I was copying out, you know? Um, so this really taught me, I think, how to be emotionally honest and emotionally invested in the lives of my fictional characters in a way that I hadn't anticipated. So it was really sort of revelatory in that way. Um, so let's see, there's a question. How did you go about finding materials about gay history? Did I contact LGBTQ plus historical preservation societies or use archival materials or personal interviews? This is from Madison. That was like, it was everything, like all of that and then some. Um, yeah, I actually went, there's this, um, I, you know, the, the one archive at USC has a really fantastic archival collection of, of, of LGBTQ uh, memorabilia um, and materials. So I spend a lot of time there. That's where I, I looked at the, I remember I mentioned the address book, those little books. I actually, um, they have a, a huge collection of them. So I was able to go there and um, the one of the um, the curators was like, I, I said, I just, I wanna see the Damron books. And he was like, okay, great. And like he brought them all out in these little boxes. And, you know, um, I took a picture of them actually. This is my picture of the covers, right? Um, and the, you know, the, you can see the years. And, you know, I just sat there and opened these very thin books and was able to sort of read through them uh, and look at the addresses of places that I recognized um, that are no longer. Um, and it was interesting holding those books because there were like marks in the pages. Um, you know, some of them were like stained. So I just would imagine like, I wonder whose pocket this was in, right? This was in some gay dude's pocket uh, decades ago. Um, a friend of mine, um, I didn't know him at the time, but he became a friend. Um, he's a visual artist who does work around um, the, the Dameron address book. He goes out and finds the physical addresses of the places and takes pictures of, of what they are now to sort of mark these, these um, locations of, of, of gay history that are no longer, because you have to understand a lot of the bathhouses and, and places like, L big cities like LA and San Francisco, during the AIDS crisis just went under, right? They just stopped um, operating because of the crisis. So they turned into other things like the bathhouse is now a real estate office or you know a barber shop. So um, Danny actually was living in Silver Lake with his partner when there was, the, the, there was that big prop eight. Um, it was like the marriage, I don't really, I just get them all confused. Um, and Danny found out that the, let's see, the, was it no one Prop 8? I don't know, which, whichever one was the bad one, like whichever one was, was, was trying to, you know, protect marriage, the, the, the sort of traditional marriage. They had set up an office in a building in a spot that used to be a gay bathhouse and they didn't know, right? So Danny was like, how fucking ironic is this, right? So he went and like, he took pictures of it. And then that led him to sort of be like, I wonder what these other places are. And so he created this book and sort of maps these, these spaces. Um, and it's almost like he's sort of grafting on this, this haunted landscape onto the Lord of sort of larger map of the city of Los Angeles. Voting yes on Prep 8 made it illegal to have same sex marriage, yeah. Um, so he, you know, I talked to him right, about his work. Um, I, you know, I, I, I bought lots of history books on ancient Greece and Rome. My partner Kyle's a classicist, so he knows a lot about ancient Greece and Rome and about homosexuality and, you know, rules that governed, like, who could, who could have a same-sex partner and who couldn't. Um, so he pointed me in the direction of a lot of books that I was able to read, um, and I did a lot of interviewing. Of, of, of friends, people that both that I knew and people that I didn't. Um, and the funny thing about the interviews was, I can't tell you how many men, both people that I knew and people that I didn't, 
were so willing to tell me about their experiences, their cruising experiences. And, and they were just like, it was almost like, oh, finally, somebody wants me to tell this, right? Um, the level of intimacy in some of the stories was, was, was something else, you know, it was like, it was like, I, um, I was going back there with them, like they could remember, you know, the color of the tiles in the bathroom, or, you know, um, how they had to tap their feet, or, you know, the marks inside the stalls, right? So, so yeah, I mean, it was, it was all of that, Madison, it was, it was all of it. And, and, um, you know, it was my only regret is that I didn't have more time to really sort of flesh a lot of a lot of this out because there's still a lot of a lot of untold stories that I I feel like didn't you know get told. Um, so Kevin asks, in what ways has the response to this book been different from the fiction you've written? Um, was anything to surprise you? You know what? Yeah, actually, that's a good question. I'm glad I'm glad you asked that. Um, it, 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 you know, my, I was, I was raised in a very hyper-Catholic family and things like homosexuality just weren't talked about. So for a long time, I sort of, you know, didn't address it with my family. Um, and it turns out that um, two of my nephews are gay and they're both brothers. So, um, and one of them is, he's, He's gender non-conforming. Um, he's he's very sex positive, right? Um, he's very open about it. So when my nephews found out that I'd written this book, they were really proud of me. Like, and I, I kept being like, oh my God, they're gonna tell that their uncle's like some, they're gonna think their uncle's like this crazy like pervert who hangs out in a bathroom and like, you know, what are they gonna think? But but they actually it was the opposite. They were like, this is awesome, you know. Um, especially Danny, my my um, the younger of the two, was um, very proud of me. And actually, I had an event at this LGBTQ um, space, community space in downtown LA, and I posted it on Instagram or something. And my nephew contacted me and said, "Oh my God, you know that 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 place was a lifesaver for me. That's where I would go, you know." Um, for you know, like I met so many people there. I met a community of of other non-binary uh, queer folks who accepted me. Um, you know, we would go there and we would have talk sessions, support each other. I love that space, and I oh my god, I'm so I'm so it's so cool that you're going to be giving a, a a reading there and a talk there, and and he showed up, uh, and and he showed up, you know, wearing you know high heels and with his hair all done up and makeup on and and he sat there and listened to me and he was so proud and so it was really like that that's I think been the most surprising is um the thing that I was the most afraid of writing actually was the thing that ended up being the most empowering right um and and I sort of was I guess the the the, the surprising another surprising thing too about it is I I just sort of asked myself why did I wait so long you know, why did I wait so long to write this? But I think our books find us. I think, I think that our books are waiting there for us. And when we're ready emotionally uh, and creatively, um, they open themselves up and they're like, okay, I think, I think it's time to take this on. So how long did it take me to write the book? Jessica says, I'm gonna say about, I'm gonna say a year and a half, two years. So that, that's a short time for me. Um, and you know, and I was writing chapters and sending them off to my, my editor and then um, they would throw back the edits and then I would be fixing the edits and then writing another chapter and send like, so I basically was writing, trying to write a chapter a week. Um, and um, it was a quick turnaround. Like they, they initially told me a year and I was like, I can't do it in a year. And they're like, all right, well, you know, I said, give me at least a year and a half. So they're like, all right. So I just kind of buckled down, drank a lot of coffee and, and wrote, you know, when, you, when you're under that kind of deadline, there's no other choice, right? Um, 
and it's the kind of the fire sometimes that you need. So it was it was a very exhausting <laughs> experience, but it was also one that I think I would probably, I would do it again in a heartbeat because it really did force me to sit down and write in a way that nothing else has. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was a lot. It was a lot. It was fun. It was fun. So yeah, any other questions? Um, stylistically, how do you feel your prose uh, kind of, you know, changes or differs or is it similar between, you know, nonfiction and fiction? Um, I think that, you know, um, you know, in, in fiction, like, like that section that I read, the last section, the language is, you know, it's sort of a, that's like, that's like fic, fic, fictional, like, like fictive language, right? Like it's, you know, it's, I try to be more lyrical and, and, and more evocative. Um, and, and in other sections, like I said, like it, you know, I sound a lot more sort of like research and scholarly, right? Um, I think I borrow from, I borrow, I borrowed a lot from fiction, right, to write, to sort of write some of this, to be poetic in ways, to, to work on like sort of threading and structure and all of those, those elements that were taught in fiction. Um, and I think that um, this, this differs um, because it allows me to sort of write in different octaves and pitches and ranges. Again, in a way that, that sometimes fiction, you know, for what, like if we decide that we're gonna write a book from one perspective, right? We have to kind of stick to that perspective and that perspective almost always has a, a distinct voice, right? Um, so I think non, the nonfiction that I wrote here allowed me to sort of play with voice a little bit more, which is something that I like to do. I mean, I did that in my first book. I, you know, my first book sort of is, is a, a, it's a, a novel that's told from multiple perspectives, both in first person and third person, right? Um, and then my second book was more traditional. So this kind of allowed me to kind of go back to exercising a little bit of what I learned in my first book, which is sort of using different ranges of voice. And that's always fun, but it's, it's tricky also. You have to maintain a consistency. So the consistency for me in this case was, um, I was gonna let my personal experiences ground the narrative, right? And, and thread it through. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think it's, you know. Um, I Any other questions? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, who's this? Uh, this is Gabriella. <laughs> in oh, hi, I'm, I'm, I was looking, I'm like, where, where is it coming from? <laughs> Yeah, um, so I haven't actually read the book yet, but it sounds like this is a book that has really tried to take something that maybe outsiders would view as um, shameful mm -hmm. and, and taking it out of the shadows and, and highlighted it as something important to gay culture. I also wonder, like, how much did you research and sort of run up against um, the experience of like straight identified men who have sex with men and um, using like cruising as an avenue for that and what that experience was like for you personally and did it did it come up at all in the book? Yeah it really didn't actually um, you know it it that and that's an aspect of 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 the book that um, I wish that I'd had more of an opportunity to develop, right? Um, there, there is a, um, an account of one individual that I interviewed who, um, who was sort of married, right? And, you know, would go and meet up with a man at these places that he'd found online. But I think it, it ultimately got sort of taken out of the book for, for whatever reason. Um, but yeah, I didn't. I didn't have much of an opportunity to 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 um, explore that um, in a way that I'd wanted to. I didn't also have much of an opportunity to explore much of the the sort of the like I said the international experience, uh, and also um, um, more of the way technology is reshaping um, the practice of cruising, right? Like how how apps 
uh, like Grindr and Scraff and, and uh, other apps are really sort of changing the culture of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot that I didn't have a chance to really, um, I also didn't like, like delve much into, it's hard research to find, but it's out there is um, female cruising, right? Um, women who cruise. Um, and, you know, there's an incident in ancient Greece or Rome that my partner told me about ancient Greece, where there was a woman who would actually pick up sailors. And, um, you know, she was arrested and she was seen as this sort of like, you know, um, it was like incredibly radical of her to do that. Um, I didn't have a chance to talk about that or write about that. Um, maybe there's a second book there <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> yeah, well, I imagine it's incredibly hard to take such a big topic and, and distill it down into one book. Um, yeah, yeah, it is. It is. And, um, you know, as I tell everyone in, in, in the beginning of the book, I'm like, this is my experience, like, you know, and, and um, I think it's important to sort of to, to when you're writing something like this to, to make sure that we work that caveat in that, like, this is one person's experience, right? It's not meant to be a universal experience. Um, because it is important um, to recognize that there are a lot of elements of, of a topic that we may research that we don't have a chance to to get to for whatever reason. I mean, there's a lot of stuff I wanted to write, but my publisher was like, we just can't, you know, um, it's either, you know, there's there's no time or, you know, we're on a deadline or, you know, um, you know, we need it to be this length or this amount or whatever. So um, there are all these factors that go into it, but I've had opportunities to write about other elements of it in like essays and, you know, to give talks about it. So in, in that way, I think, there are opportunities to discuss it um, beyond the book, but I would like to see um, to see it more sort of continued. So maybe somebody out there will write, you know, their own version of it, which I would love to see. Actually, there's a guy who wrote this really good book called Gay Bar, Why We Went Out. And it's it's about um, the presence of the gay bar in, in gay culture um, and and the sort of the hookups that happen there, right? It's a really good book. And um, he's a fantastic writer. So it, it was nice. And they asked me for, to, I blurbed the book because he really liked my book. And so it's cool to see like how our books are in conversation with each other, right? Like his does something totally different. Um, but he read my book and he loved it. And he was like, I want, I need a blurb from that guy. And then the, the <laughs> publisher contacted me. I was like, yeah. And I read it and I loved it. So um, yeah, hopefully there'll be an opportunity to write more about that. Well, as someone who's a part of the queer community and grew up in the queer community, I think this book sounds incredibly important. So thank you for doing no that. No problem. Bring this, this kind of stuff out of the shadows and, you know, lessen the stigma. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you, can you talk a little bit more about <laughs> the tension and relationship um, and the process of working with research and working with, personal experience um just talk about i mean I, it seems like to me that's there's no one way um I, and maybe no two books even by a single author handle that the same way um but can you just yeah. talk about um what that was like in your own mind and and just you know when you found research leading you somewhere in personal experience and vice versa and just maybe kind of yeah, I think, I think what I tried to do is I always tried to put my experiences, like, like, I, like just like, like I mentioned with that last book is like, how are my experiences in conversation with this, the sort of larger historical or, or, or cultural um, movements, you know, uh, that have happened throughout this practice, right? Like how, how, am I, how are my memories and my experiences conversing with that? Um, what can my experiences say to punctuate um, something, you know, that happened to an individual in a Molly house in 1800s London, right? When he was outed, um, you know, or how, you know, can my experiences at a, you know, at a bus stop when I was 16 um, relate to what's, what was happening sort of you know, uh, nationally in the US during the Reagan era and AIDS and all of that. So that that's kind of, that was one approach that I took. 
Um, another one was like, you know, if I reached a dead end in research or I was like, okay, I don't, I don't know how I'm gonna, you know, where I'm gonna go here at this point, I'd switch to like more personal things, right? I'd be like, okay, well, let me, let me write this moment that I remember, that I recall, and let me, let me just write this. And then when the personal moment sort of, when I ran out of steam with that, then I'd go back to the research, right? So, so it was always sort of like, like how are these two things conversing and, and, and talking to each other? I think that, that was one of the approaches that I took. But yeah, you're right. I don't think, you know, I think if I ever write another nonfiction book, my, 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 um, my technique is probably gonna be different, right? Because I'm gonna be looking at, some, at a very different um, subject, right? Um, so we'll, we'll wait and see. But yeah, it's always like, how, how are my experiences relevant to sort of the larger, um, you know, historical uh, experiences of the gay community that I'm writing about? Like, what, what can I say um, to augment like the, the, um, the research that I found here? It's interesting because it, it sounds, it sounds as though you felt like um, in the conversation that, that the lead was the research, which seems to me kind of the opposite of, of uh, you know, when you talk to a lot of nonfiction writers, they think, oh, I had this experience. I climbed a mountain or I got divorced or, you know, I had a, lo- a, pers- a, a grief loss. And that was sort of, the, that was the, the trigger that was in the driver's seat. And then when I needed to move further forward or make it more universal, you know, prevent it from becoming sort of hermetic, then I would kind of reach out into the research. So it's super interesting to me that it, it sounds as though you, you know, you were began with a kind of more universal or the more, the more public, and then use that as a lens to understand and, and to get the personal out. Yeah, you're right. For me, it was the opposite, right? It was the total opposite. Um, I never thought of that, but yeah, you're right. That's actually what, what it was. Yeah, maybe I'll try that again. <laughs> that's, I think that's probably, you know, somebody who's, somebody who's written a few novels and done a lot of the sort of first person or, you know, close character driven stuff. Um, I think it's maybe more the impulse for, you know, for first and second book people whose first and second book is a memoir or a personal experience book to, to drive by character and then to sort of reach for theme and reach for yeah. larger understandings. So it's it maybe a function, who knows, but it, maybe it's a function of having done that quite a bit and then, you know, found this other really important door. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Everybody's all like, okay, who's gonna ask the next question? <laughs> talk, about, talk, about going, talk about going back to your undergrad to teach. That's really super interesting to me. Um, I'm, I'm curious. My, my dad, I was born in Fresno and my dad oh, did his MFA. Were. I was, yeah. I, and I got out within a year. Um, so I, I like to think I had good geographical instincts before I had any agency. <laughs> um, and my, my dad went to the MFA at Irvine. Um, so you're, oh, he you're, did. Yeah, my sister teaches at UC San Bernardino. So your geography to me is super interesting. Um, and I'm just wondering if you can talk about what it was like, you know, stepping back on campus as a faculty member, not, and not just a faculty member, but as a faculty member, you know, with a lot of status and like really sort of recognized as having been exemplary of what they want undergrads to think about was possible for their lives. Um, especially at a school like Riverside, which is a really interesting blend of, I mean, it's a school of access, but it's a school of access that sort of accelerates access, right? Because it's, yeah. it's so well thought of. Um, any, any thoughts on what it's like being back at the home school? It's, um, it's very humbling. You know, it's, it's, I think, um, I wasn't expecting it. Like I, I really, um, I had, um, moved down here, uh, I'd left Fresno and was teaching at Cal State LA, actually. Cal State LA hired me. Um, the, the, the president of the campus had been my provost at Fresno State. So he really liked me. So he was like, I want to bring you to Cal State LA. I'm like, okay, great, like, but in what capacity? I'm not gonna be an administrator. And, and so they found a way, like he's, he's really determined. So before I knew it, they were like, hey, we want you to come and start an MFA program in creative writing at Cal State LA. And like, 
fine, okay, I'll do it. Like that's how I was so desperate to leave Fresno. Um, you know, I I miss I, you know I miss my friends dearly in Fresno. I had a great group of friends, but it was it was hard for me personally, and so I took the job. I was here teaching at Cal State LA, and then um, I was contacted by a friend of mine um, who was leading the um, search for the position. Our, our mutual friend of Greg, Michael Jaime, and. Michael reached out and said, hey, so we're looking for, you know, this position and we would like for you to consider applying. And I was like, why? You <laughs> know, like, I'm not ready. This is an endowed chairship. And, you know, so it was, it was a real surprise. Like I, I, you know, and, and then I bought a suit and then I got my CV ready and I got my talk ready and I, you know, so I was like, all right, here I go again. And then Kyle, my partner, he's a really good sport. He's like, well, if anything, it's good practice, right? He's like, you already have a job. You know, he's like, think about, you know, other people out there who, who don't. And, you know, and, you know, so I was like, you know what, you're right. So I went and I, you know, I did my thing and, and, and that was it. And I, I didn't hear anything. So I was like, well, maybe I didn't get it. Um, and then they, they, they asked me if I, if I wanted it. And so I was like, and then my, and then Cal State LA actually was like, no, 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 you're not, no, you're not, you're gonna come, you know? And, but ultimately UCR, you know, I think just going from a Cal State to a UC is, it's just a different um, academic, academically cultural experience. Um, it's been, you know, it's been very humbling. It's been very, um, you know, for, without sounding too corny, I do kind of feel like it's a dream come true because, you know, I landed at UCR in 1998. I had no idea what I was doing. I only knew that people kept saying I was a good writer. So I was like, all right, well, maybe I'll study creative writing. And I was lucky enough to meet a writer like Susan Strait, who read what I was doing and was really smart and really savvy. And she said, okay, you know, two things like, one, here, you got to read this. And two, you got to stop killing people in your stories. Because like, I would always kill people. Like I was telling the workshop this, like, like in my stories, it was always like somebody died. Like that was the big sort of, and, and Susan would just say like, you, you got to stop killing your, like, she pulled me aside. She's like, is everything okay? <laughs> like, I was like, yeah, no, why? She's like, because you kill people. In, in your stories. I'm like, well, somebody always has to die. She's like, no, they don't. And I was like, well, what, what do they do? And she's like, well, they can like go out and have coffee or have a conversation or maybe sit in a car. Like, and, and, and then, then she's like, read these stories. Like, tell me if anybody dies. And then like, I read like James Baldwin and she studied with James Baldwin. And so, so I was like, oh, okay. Like, yeah, okay, I get it. And, you know, I really didn't know what I was doing. And, you know, there was a faculty member who who actually was was honest enough with me to say you're right you don't know what you're doing but here's what you're doing right and and here's why you have to keep doing it you know um susan really taught me um to love like fiercely uh and emotionally um the landscape that i was writing about no matter how misunderstood it was uh, and to love the people that I was writing about that inhabit those landscapes, right? So she, and she, she, she was the first one to tell me like, you gotta treat your characters with honesty and dignity. Don't shortchange their lives. And, and, and places like Riverside, the Inland Empire, like Colton, you know, the place that I wrote about, she's like, you know, you, you gotta make those interesting. You gotta make people outside of those places care about, about it. Um, you know, people, people ignore them enough. Right. And, you know, and she was honest. She's like, you know what, I don't know if New York's ever going to want to read a book about a bunch of Mexican people living in, in inland Southern California, but, but go ahead. I think, I think you need to do it. And, and that's what I did. And, and so, you know, when I sold, when I signed my contract, and I got my book deal and I, you know, I was over the moon. I, I called Susan and, and she said, 
okay, the first thing she said to me was, now it's your turn. And I said, well, what do you mean? She's like, she's like, you know how I was, I, I read your stories and, you know, I was always here and, you know, we always talk stories and we, you know, and I made myself available to you. And I was like, yeah, she said, well, now it's your turn. She's like, now you got to do the same thing. You got to keep the door open for other people. So I was like, okay, I can do that. And then that led me to Fresno, right? <laughs> um, for whatever reason, you know, at the time it seemed like the lot next logical step. And then uh, now, now back. So it, you know, I look at my undergrads and I see myself and, you know, and I tell them that every day I remind them of that, that like I was you and um, this is what worked for me. And if you want to have this career and, and write these stories, then this is what somebody who was a lot wiser than me told me. Um, so it's, I mean, it's a real thrill. It's, I can't, you know, I can't really put it into words. It, it is really a dream come true to be able to to call myself the Tomas that I'm Dow chair uh, after a writer who I really admired, who I read as an undergrad. Um, when, when I was um, taking my first class, my first quarter at UCR was a, uh, one of my first classes was a world lit seminar and there were um, 80 or 90 students in the class. And um, one of the TAs, um, Rec like she started to recognize that my papers were always very well written. Um, I always had really sound arguments. And when the quarter ended, she handed me a manila envelope and inside of it was a copy of Tomas Rivera's novel and the earth did not devour him. And she wrote me a letter and she said, I hope that you some, I hope you, so I hope someday you get to write a book or a collection of stories that showcase the fine writer that you are or, or something like that, right? I kept that book for years. And when I went to UC Riverside to give my job talk, I had the book, right? And I opened it up and I showed them, I showed everybody the letter, right? And Tomas Rivera's widow was in the audience. And I was like, look, like this is what his legacy has meant to someone like me. Um, and and it was you know it's something that I I never I always carry with me you know I always have that memory so yeah it's been it's been great you know I, I love the people that I teach with my friend Michael and Susan are there and you know I love our students and um, you know I I couldn't be at a better place that's a long response. <laughs> Well, it's interesting, right? I mean, I think there's been a long-standing assumption or a long-standing prejudice against it, right? That what what's supposed to happen is that there's so, sort of some central, key, important institutions. It's kind of been like a kind of academic colonialism, right? That there's oh, yeah, yeah. there's ten really important institutions, and their job is to sort of spawn faculty members for everybody else, right? And and go out and kind of like evangelize in the in the provinces. Um, and then they, you know, they th and then tell that in those institutions turn out another generation that they send out to the provinces. And right. the idea of the idea of you being able to stand in front of your students and say, you know, I, I I'm not from Columbia, right? I'm not I'm not from Princeton. Um, like th I think that there's something. Not that there's anything wrong with that at all. I mean, you know, kid kick kid kicks their tail and works incredibly hard and goes to a school like that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. I, I'm not implying any sort of reverse yeah. prejudice, but but for kids to be able to look up and say, "Wow, this is somebody who's doing exactly what I did um, at the exact place," um, I think that um, yeah, it's 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 magnificent because I think there's been far mm. too much sort of prejudice against bringing people back. Um, there's a, yeah. a sort of an assumption of some kind of you know nepotism or something. There's something nefarious about it when I think it's. It, it offers students an inspiration. Yeah, yeah, no, there's this, this notion of like, oh, you're cannibalizing, right? Like you're just sort of, you know, everyone's migrating in. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, I think that one of the things that, you know, I'm, I was very grateful for my, my graduate experience at UC Irvine. Like I was, you know, I learned a lot, you know, it was, it was a very rigorous program. It was, you know, incredibly competitive. Um, it, it, it taught me a lot um, 
I, but I think one of the things that it, it, it showed me was that there were rules, right? Um, and it made those rules very plain, very open. And it made me realize that I didn't want to play by them, right? Like, like I just, I don't, I don't want to participate in that, right? And, and I was lucky enough to work with, with two faculty members there who recognized that and were like, fine, <laughs> like, we're not going to force you to. Um, but if, if, if anything, that very rigorous, very um, sort of demarcated environment, um, I almost had to put myself in it, right, in order to, to figure out how I was, was going to break out of it, right? And, and I was grateful for that because I think it made me not just a better writer, but a better um, teacher of the craft, right? And, and you know, that's a, that's a knowledge and an experience that I always try to impart on my students. It's like, yeah, you know, we, we operate in an institution that for if you're a member of a community of color or difference, if you're a woman or gay or, um, we operate in an institution that wasn't meant for people like us, right? It was historically not created uh, for us, but here we are now. So what are we gonna do? Are we gonna play by the rules that try to keep us out? Or are we gonna break them apart and fuck them up, right? I'm for the latter, you know? Um, and, and I was lucky that, I mean, for whatever reason, you know, every, kind of every place that I, that I taught at was, would always sort of tell me like, these are the rules. And then I would say, fine, but I'm not gonna play by your rules. And sure, I pissed a lot of people off, especially at Fresno, but you know, I, I, I don't know how to operate any other way. I mean, you're, you're looking at someone who you know, by all accounts, should either be, you know, um, dead or, you know, strung out on drugs or in jail or working a dead end job, right? And it was literature and it was stories and it was, it was, you know, um, writing that really gave me an opportunity to see a life outside of that reality, right? And so you put me in an institution where that's that's all about rules and and you know steps and all of that, and I'm just like no, <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm gonna find a way around it, you know. And you know UCR, if anything, was like fine, go ahead, you know, like here here's money, do it, <laughs> like you know they this this chairship has money, so go go do it. And um, it's kind of weird, you know. I, I always feel like I have to keep checking with people. And they're always like, my dean's office is like, you don't have to keep asking. I'm like, okay. But, you know, old habits die hard. But yeah. It's getting kind of late. And that is a really great note to go out on, I think. All Were right. there any last questions? Anyone have a last burning question? Don't be shy. No takers. Yeah, this is just, this is just water, by the way, Tim. It's not anything. Really? Really? <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I know. It's already past my bedtime. Like I, I turned into this person where it's like it's nine o'clock. I need to put my pajamas on. And well, I actually live in my pajamas right, these days. Who doesn't? Right. I'm, I'm like sweats. Yeah. I'm just like sweats all the time now. I'm proud of it. <laughs> Well, thanks everybody for coming out and Alex, thanks for taking time to hang out with us, answer questions, read that. It was really great, really wonderful. No event. problem. It was my, my, it. my pleasure. We're, we're lucky that we get to spend, you know, time like this, right? Like yep. who wouldn't want to spend an evening talking with new friends and, you know, ruminating on writing and yeah. sharing experiences. I mean, it's lovely. Yes. So thank you for inviting me. And thank you everyone for we'll do for it again. There. We'll do it when you can come in person and finally get to Washington. I know. I I really want to get to Washington State. I'm determined. We'll do it. We will All do right. it. <laughs> All right. Okay. Bye everyone. Thanks. Good night.